retreat or conference. Uh, I think, yes, why is not? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. yes, but you're just sharing the last, the last slide. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Just put in the, the first one. Okay, so this is it, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so some general information for those of you who uh, haven't joined yesterday, let's say. Though, so I would like to let you know that the event is being recorded. I hope nobody has any objections on that. Um, presentations and recording will be shared on the event page uh, to all the participants uh, afterwards. Uh, all your microphones uh, will be off. And if you want to ask a question or any other, make a comment and so on, uh, either raise your hand uh, so I can give you the floor or use the chat for comments and, and questions to the speakers or to interact with the other participants. Uh, there are some hashtags here for uh, social media interaction. Uh, and uh, very briefly to introduce you to the agenda, first we have the, key, uh, the keynote speech. Uh, by Dr. Ellen Marie Fosberg uh, from Norwegian Institute uh, for Sustainability Research. And then we break to two rooms, two parallel sessions. You have to choose to which session uh, you go. Uh, one is, the first one is titled Paving the Way to Institutional Change via a quadruple helix responsible for research innovation embedment methodology. And the, sec the second session is Institutional change in territorial, regional context, and crowding disposable research innovation organizations. Now you can see my name in both of them. This is uh, clearly a mistake. I cannot be in two uh, places at the same time. Uh, so the first one is going to be uh, moderated by my colleague, Dr. Adrian Solomon, and I'm going to moderate and, and present in the second parallel session. Uh, so, I have uh, a vested interest of you joining the second one. <laughs> but okay, join the first one as well. Uh, and then we have an interactive session being moderated by my colleague, uh, Dr. Elasterakis, uh, who is going to initiate a discussion about how to help your organization trigger institutional change uh, to foster responsible research, innovation, and open science. I would also like to, to remind you that you have to click in each one of these sessions and, and sort of register in order to, to follow uh, each one of them. Uh, so now I'm, I'm going to, to give the floor to uh, Dr. Ellen Marie Fosberg uh, for her uh, uh, keynote speech on the responsible research and innovation and institutional change. Uh, Dr. Fosberg is a managing director and senior researcher the Norwegian Institute for Sustainability Research. And uh, uh, she has built up uh, the also research group on uh, responsible research innovation and participated in several RRI projects, including the RRI practice project. And he has a lot of uh, publications on uh, responsible research innovation, uh, including a book that she co authored uh, lately on implementing responsible research innovation, organizational and national conditions. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and uh, Dr. Fosberg, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, yes, you can see it. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very honored to be uh, asked to uh, to give this uh, speech and um, I'm very happy to be with the RI community again. I wish it was in Rome, <laughs> but uh, I'm looking forward to very fruitful uh, discussions also online. So um, thanks for a good uh, introduction. Um, let me see if I can, yeah. Um, I will, uh, I'm mainly based on the experiences from the RI practice project, I will be talking about three main and interrelated topics. So changes in research in institutions as organizations and changes in um, academia or research as a societal institution. I will talk about promotion of RI as an overall philosophy or policy. Um, 
and promotion of the RI keys and deep institutional change versus incremental changes. So I won't be saying much about the project, uh, but just enough so you kind of understand what kind of project it was. Um, it was a three-year SWOFTS project that uh, ended last year. Um, we had partners from 12 countries around the world. Um, the aim was to analyze our related discourses and pathways to implementation, including barriers and drivers in, in fact, 23 research conducting and funding organizations uh, in order to identify, understand, disseminate and promote RI implementation best practices. And you recognize this. We were to make RI action plans like several projects um, have been doing. So, um, you know, more or less, I think what we were do trying to achieve in the project. ROI practice had a explicitly uh, organizational focus. So we focused on research conducting and research funding organizations, but we also saw them in a national context. So we analyzed uh, these organizations and tried to work with them as embedded in a context. Today, I will be talking also about another dimension that we didn't address very much in the RI practice project, namely research or academia as an institution uh, across countries that also these organizations relate to. So we used um, neo-institutional theory in the, pro in the project Especially, we, we built our uh, analytic approach on Scott, uh, the book you can see here on the screen. And I will also be using resources from new institutional theory today because I think it's a very rich field uh, of, um, or a scholarly field that gives a lot of very interesting resources for understanding institutional change. So I can recommend going deeper into that if you're not so familiar with this literature. Institutional change is the, the topic this morning and institutional change uh, was one of the goals for the SWOFTS program, at least in their second, or their last uh, period from uh, 2018 to 2020. They built it around five strategic orientations where the first one was accelerating and catalyzing processes of institutional change. So they wrote that this part will contribute to implementing the RI keys through institutional governance changes in funding and performing organizations. And they say in an integrated way, and it's not exactly clear what they mean. And also this key performance indicator of SWOFs was related to the number of institutional change actions promoted by the program. And again, they say these can take the form of a package of changes across all or several of the five RRI keys. So I'll, I'll come back to that. For those of you who have been reporting to the European Commission, you have seen this uh, Excel sheet where we, are supposed to, we were supposed to report on the number and character of institutional changes that were the result of our project. So in our practice, we reported 84 institutional changes. Um, and the way to report it was to indicate where the institutional change took place and whether it was related to ethics or open access or science education or what they call the full RI package. And then you would explain how some sort of new initiative uh, was the result of uh, either directly or indirectly of the project. Um, so SWOFS has been um, evaluated and a very nice report, two reports actually were written um, and they write that 238 individual institutional change actions were implemented and probably more because not all of the projects have re finished reporting yet. So um, SWOFS surpassed its target of 100 institutional changes in the beneficiaries. So they were quite happy with the outcomes and that obviously didn't 
it didn't uh, help because so there won't be any more swaps, even though it uh, was successful on its own key performance indicator. I will also just read a section from that report because it says something about how the European Commission thinks about institutional changes. Um, so they, they write the project aiming to open up research funding and performing organizations use a variety of approaches and methods, um, identify best practice, analyzing obstacles. Um, and they say that uh, one of the main outcomes of the portfolio of projects is strong evidence-based inventory of impactful practices for the uptake of RI. Um, they show that different changes require varying amounts of effort. Uh, some are easier to implement than others, and uh, all manner of changes can be impactful depending on context. So, and they say finally, the changes introduced represent significant steps forward towards RI for the organizations concerned. But I think we have to ask the question what is an institutional change and what is an institution? Uh, especially when you go back and you look at, you know, the 84 institutional changes we reported, you can always ask the question to what extent that was an ins institutional change and, and in, in, uh, in what sense. The problem with institution and institutional change as a concept is that it has also in normal language two meanings and I think often it's not clear which one we mean when we discuss. Um, so just, if you just Google institution, you will get these two meanings. And one is that it's an organization. So a university is a higher education institution. Uh, the other is that it's an established law or practice, like here, the institution of marriage. But you can also say that there is an institution of academia or maybe an institution of research is a question, of course, but that means that there's kind of a, an overall practice, societal practice with certain norms, values, conventions. And when we are talking about institutional change, we are some, sometimes talking about one and sometimes talking about the other. Do we want to change the organizations, the conventions or both? And I think that we've seen now from what I've read from SWOFs that it's about organizations. The institutional changes are in changes in organizations. The organizational level and the overall societal institution level are, of course, um, related. Uh, an organization like a university needs the legitimacy as an organization in this overall institution. Um, and this legitimacy can be gained through different kinds of uh, factors that are embraced in the overall societal institution. So for instance, uh, it will, uh, its status will depend on things like university rankings, Nobel Prize winners, scores on indicators, etc. And I just took a, an example from Uppsala University, which frames itself on its web pages very much in these terms. So it says it's number 124 on the global world ranking. Its research output is on some indicator very high. Um, it says in the text that eight scientists at the university have been awarded the Nobel Prize. So this is something that matters to universities. So when we want to change organizations like Uppsala University, we didn't work with that, but you know, that could be an example. How much can we actually try to change these organizations in the direction of RI before it starts to kind of challenge these academic uh, conventions in the overall institution and reduce the organization's academic legitimacy? Unless we also reduce, or unless we also change the societal institution uh, as an overall uh, institution. So there is a, a tension here. Um, I think that if we want to make institutional changes in the overall institution of academia, 
we can work with organizations. We can work with individual uh, um, universities as well to have that kind of uh, impact on the overall institution. We can work for, if, if we get Cambridge and Oxford to change or other very prestigious uh, universities, that will have an uh, impact on uh, the overall institution. Uh, we also need to work with the organizations that represent the, this societal institution, <clears throat> like the university, the European University Alliance, League of Un European Research Intensive Universities, and other organizations like Science LA, uh, Europe LA, etc. I think in addition, if we want to change the institution, the overall societal institution, I think we need a critical discussion of like global university rankings, the global role of Ivy League universities, uh, the, publish, the international publishing houses and their impact on how you, uh, all actors in the um, institution are being assessed, intellectual property rights organizations and their influence on the way research is being assessed. <clears throat> because when we work with, you know, employing, for instance, this is just an example, a public engagement officer at the University, University of Bristol. How can that change academia as such to be more responsible? And it, it might actually do it because we might see that there are some learning processes over time, experiences are being shared, it reaches the, these uh, uh, overall institutional organizations, but not necessarily because there are many other incentives that work against it. And, and that was what we focused on in our recommendations from the RI practice project. Um, the two first are to change the incentive regime to promote an organizational culture for RI and broaden the concept of excellence and impact because these two are norms from the overall institution that kind of puts a lid on, on, on RRI and the capacity organizations have to engage in public engagement and engage in more anticipatory and inclusive activities. So we have been discussing the RRI keys for years um, and uh, I think we have to <laughs> we turn to that discussion again, because what is an the, what is an institutional change and what impact does it have? And many of the institutional changes we've seen are uh, on the keys. Um, so, is that a distraction or is it a ladder on a more kind of on on the way to a more uh, fully responsible research and innovation system? in line with the RI philosophy and and uh, I, I quite like the uh, definition that is given by the European Commission uh, that RI is an approach that anticipates and assesses potential implications and societal expectations with regard to research and innovation with the aim to foster the design of inclusive and sustainable research and innovation. So is, 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 are the keys a way to get there? And I, I think we see, you know, also from the SWOFs evaluation report, they present uh, the institutional changes broken down on the keys. So a lot of them are uh, establishing a new gender equality uh, policy, for instance, or a, an office, or establishing a system for open access. So it's not so, <laughs> it's not such an integrated package that it was kind of, uh, um, uh, formulated in the beginning. But you could hope that maybe even institutional changes on the level of the RI keys, it would be a means to kind of open up the system. So in RI practice, we did um, an analytic job on um, uh, analyzing how, what, what kind of practices were mentioned. So we analyzed the 12 national reports uh, and looked at what was mentioned as good practices, either existing or in, uh, as part of the RI plans. And uh, we saw across the keys, 
that what is most frequently noted is um, in the individual practices. This is pilot projects, like experiments, like, okay, we had this project in a neighborhood in our, in Karlsruhe, where we engaged citizens in discussions about cities, urban, ur, uh, urban research, for instance, things like that. And then the next, frequ next most frequently mentioned was um, setting up an organizational unit, like a public engagement office or a gender office, making pol organizational policies on RRI, public engagement, starting doing research on these kinds of topics, checklists and toolkits. So you see the list. So maybe you could hope that even if they are on very specific parts of the RRI construct, um, it, it starts gearing the organizations towards other uh, values or other uh, aspects of research than simply excellence or, or production of uh, publication points. So maybe it's a way for increased responsiveness to societal values and concerns. And you have to remember that we work with organizations in India, China, and Brazil, and their starting point was, it varied very much. So for some organizations, that was a big breakthrough, maybe on the steps towards more responsive research and innovation. And maybe these incremental changes are what we can expect. So that will be my last uh, reflections and going back to neo-institutional theory. Um, we could say that we could look at what is noted in a very simplistic way uh, from my side as uh, forces of institutional change and see that these forces are perhaps not very strong in what at least we found in our uh, practice project. So in the theory, they talk about institutional and technical forces in the environment. And you can note, for instance, changes in national conditions for university funding would be such uh, a force. So if uh, the ministries of higher education start funding universities uh, but based on different criteria, that would definitely be a force for change in the universities. Uh, another force for change in the universities uh, would be, or in academia as such, would be exogenous shocks, like a dramatic loss of, of trust in science, um, maybe due to big misconduct scandals or uh, react public reactions to some sort of well, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, these kinds of things or that there is an increasingly important competing logic, uh, for instance, it, an, an alternative to the excellence logic, if that comes up as a very kind of strong force, uh, that would change the um, universities. So um, we don't really see those, these three first forces are exogenous and we don't really see that they are perceived as being so strong that they are motivating a deep institutional change. Um, there is an increasing, imp increasingly important competing logic related to sustainability and societal challenge driven research. That is changing uh, academia, but to what extent that's a radical change, you, you, I think it's, uh, <laughs> that's a discussion. And then you see the, the fourth one is endogenous change. So that's what you can do from within institutional entrepreneurship, either that one organization takes a lead in changing the whole overall institution or a person in an organization can change that organization. And I think that uh, in SWOFs, they're basically trying to influence the endogenous factors. So they are trying, they're using us to, uh, uh, be change agents and champions for RI and influencing the organizations we work with. It's much harder for the SWOFTS program to influence these three first ones. Um, so I, I think, yeah, so it's kind of natural that they, they chose to work 
to put their efforts into the endogenous uh, factor. I think that lasting institutional change would require both endogenous and exogenous factors. And I think maybe we see it at least partly in open access, not open science, but open access. This has become uh, um, an area of research policy where there are both external expectations from funders and also there have been very important change agents. But for a deep institutional change of academia, we don't, at least not from our experience, we don't see that combination, at least not yet. We see, and that was very widespread, an acknowledgement of the need for incremental improvements. So almost everyone we spoke with would agree that you could be better on gender, on, on sharing of research, on science communication. So there is a, a common understanding of the need for incremental improvements but not for the deep institutional change. And we can discuss that, of course. <clears throat> and I, I, I would like to discuss it too, because um, and I, I, this is a picture of the University of Bologna. It's been there for a thousand years, and I, I hope it will be there for another thousand years. And of course, it's not been the same. It's adapting all the time, but there's perhaps something in the core of what it's doing that should remain the same, that, and that's actually good. <laughs> we don't want too deep transformation. Um, we want the right kind of uh, adjustments. Um, and I think we, what we haven't addressed sufficiently is how we are being influenced by logics that are external to research itself. So I'm thinking of new public management, production indicators, global competitive ethos, publishing industry, intellectual property rights, and other things. And it's Influencing academia as such is hard to address. Uh, it's hard for us to tackle. It's hard for Horizon Europe to tackle. There are questions of politics. There are questions of international politics with institutions that are very difficult to influence. So in Horizon Europe, the RI agenda will be less visible. Uh, and maybe it, RI didn't have the force to kind of tackle these systemic problems but maybe open science would be a better instrument. And if Rene von Schomburg was here, he would probably argue for that. That remains to be seen and uh, whether kind of the same would happen to open science that it's reduced to open access. Um, I think also we would have to ask if we need kind of new global coalitions beyond what the European Commission can do, because this is not only a European uh, question. But if we need that kind of global coalitions, and of course UNESCO is already there, but maybe not in a position to tackle that. I think the next question is then, what are our responsibilities as a European RI community? What can we do? Are we contributing to the kind of institutional change globally on uh, of academia research that we believe is necessary. So I think that was basically reflections, not so clear conclusions from my side, but hopefully they will spur some, uh, some more uh, discussion in, uh, in the audience, I hope so. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fosberg. Uh, for a very, very nice and very inspiring uh, uh, introduction to this, uh, all these uh, uh, issues. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing there are a lot of questions, but uh, you want to ask a question, please go ahead. We're like 53 people now here, but I think the, the, the platform can handle that. Or you can write a question in the chat and uh, I will read them. Uh, so whoever wants to to ask a question. Uh, let me see now. Let me try to find that. There's nothing in the chat. So who wants to? Yes, Luciano. I see that you raise your hand. You can. I think you can. You can go ahead and, and and talk. I don't need to do something. Okay. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for the for the.
A Luciano que no... science, uh, less of authorities, uh, uh, lay people uh, deciding to interact directly with the leaderships and so forth, uh, and what is happening in science. So the question is what means, uh, what institutional change means is that institutional change is already occurring because institutional change are occurring every day and in many ways so counting institutional changing changes uh, a, a little bit strange because it's an, quite an uncountable uh, uh, term, institutional change, including many things uh, occurring uh, every day. So I think as institutional change, uh, the hyper competition, the change in the relationship, the organization of research organization, for example, uh, we, the, the end of the community of peers, typically of the science of the past, and now we have people that are the especially PhD students working uh, hard uh, and uh, without any possibility to enter the system uh, or think about the crisis of the reproducibility of, uh, of, of data, what is happening for what concern uh, peer review and so forth. There are many uh, institutional change already occurring. So uh, the question is, uh, uh, what are we are doing? I believe that what we are doing is uh, uh, with through RRI and through other, uh, I mean, uh, labels under different labels. For example, uh, we can think about smart innovation, for example. Uh, we are trying to manage politically these changes. Uh, changes that are already occurring and the problem is that they are affecting the, 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 the very way in which uh, scientific science, uh, scientific knowledge is produced. So it's something serious. It's not concerning only science-society relationships in the terms of uh, public engagement or democratization. It's something concerning the role of science in our society and the possibility for science to keep on producing scientific knowledge in a new context, in new social context. So. Uh, I believe that RRI and, and, uh, is not the answer, also because probably it's only a label. Uh, but the question underlying RRI is really serious because the problem is managing in a way or in another, changes are already occurring and that could, be, uh, could have some serious consequences about the possibility to produce reliable knowledge. Uh, so we have to change the way to do that. That, that is the question. So uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I uh, stress this point, but uh, it's particularly important understanding what we are doing because uh, mm -hmm. otherwise if we consider RI so important, uh, we have to take on, into consideration that probably in the next uh, European framework program, RRI will be a term that will be used lesser and lesser. Uh, the question is understanding what is under, uh, under the, 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 the label. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the, the question is serious and will continue to be serious for a long period of time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Can I just briefly comment to that? Um, yes, of course. Yeah. No, I, I think that... Um, from uh, our experience in our practice, there isn't really a widespread understanding that there is a crisis in research. Um, I think that the stakeholders, uh, uh, at least in the countries and around the organizations that we studied, were saying that, yeah, it's mostly on track. Uh, we have to, I think the agenda that it has the highest potential for change now is uh, the societal challenge uh, agenda and the sustainability ag agenda and now you know with COVID-19 and everything it, there's a 
a very widespread uh, consensus that we have to uh, orient the research system more towards uh, solving these uh, urgent societal challenges. Uh, and of course, climate change is also one of those. So th I think that has, but I think that there, there is a, from our experience, this is possible with adjustments of the system in a certain direction that's taking place already. So there isn't this common understanding uh, that there is a, a big threat to the research uh, system in general, I would say. So if that's not an uh, if that's not a shared diagnosis, then you know RI won't be the answer, <laughs> or RI is just an answer to more kind of manageable questions about increasing you know gender sensitivity or or um, eth research ethics and research. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fosbury, there's one question uh, in the chat. Uh, let me uh, read it for you. So from uh, Giovanni de Gradis, uh, I'd like to ask a question. If it is so difficult to implement deep changes in academic research because of the forces working against change, how much more difficult is to implement changes towards responsible innovation in private companies, where I believe that the forces working against it are even stronger? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's the tricky one. We, we didn't study that in our right practice, but I have some experience with it from other contexts and um, I'm not so sure. I, th I think that in some contexts, the uh, actually private industry uh, are more uh, uh, progressive than uh, the state. For instance, when it comes to sustainability and, and you know green uh, adapting to the green uh, uh, climate change and to making cleaner and greener production, um, quite a few companies are taking stronger actions than what is required or expected uh, from the national authorities. So. Um, I don't think uh, the answer is so clear cut. Uh, if I can make if I can make a comment on that, uh, following what, what your answer, Dr. Fosberg, I, I think that there are uh, plus and minuses uh, in, in this context because in in a, in a private uh, institution, uh, when a decision is being made to, for an institutional change. The, the internal resistance might be a lot less than the internal resistance in academia, let's say, where there is a, a much more, uh, uh, let's say, there much, there's much more leeway to, 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 to not do things or to not implement things and so on. So it's, uh, yeah. in, in a lot of cases, we might see that uh, it might be easier in this way. Mm. We did study one private funder in Italy. And, uh, and that was a very good example, actually, of uh, it was funding medical research. And um, it was uh, taking, for instance, this public engagement and user involvement very much more seriously than uh, all other kinds of uh, research uh, uh, organizations we studied in the project, because it had to. So, um, yeah. Okay, there's an another question from Fabio Faudo. Uh, from your experience on RRI practice, did you deal with the issue to make the changes sustainable and durable beyond the lifespan of the project? Yeah, we, I, we tried to do that and to indicate follow-up uh, and make the action plans uh, in a way that, you know, they would have follow-up points and assessments, but it's really hard because it's a three-year project and we couldn't, you know, keep following up the organization. So the only thing we could do was to, we worked with a action research methodology. So the action plans that were made were not coming from us, but from the organizations themselves. So I think that that would be the best way to ensure that it would actually be followed up because it would have gone through a system of decision making in the organizations. But we don't know that. We can't know whether they actually did what they said they would. Yeah. Uh I don't see any other. Can I ask one question? 
uh, if I may. Uh, in, in your project, a very interesting uh, aspect is that you worked a lot with a lot of countries that are not uh, as European or outside of the European Union. And uh, LRI, I mean, as a concept, is a, is a, is a, is a European concept uh, devised by the European Commission. Of course, a lot of the issues are uh, very global, like ethics and gender and everything. But what is, what is your experience? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on, on non-European countries, especially, you know, like China, India, Brazil? Yeah. No, we, we were very conscious of, of that. So what we did, and I didn't go into that today, but we, uh, we, when we work with action plans uh, and work with the organizations and also the countries, we, uh, we uh, of course, focused on the keys because, well, we had to. <laughs> that was kind of written into the topic des description. But also the air dimensions because we believe that they represent our eye in a good way. But finally, we asked in the beginning of the project, what is responsibility in research and innovation for you? So, um, uh, that that allowed for that kind of operationalization um, that was um, uh, that makes sense to 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 China or India or Brazil, uh, and I think it wasn't that different from what how we see it in in Europe because it's a global system and you know people travel across India and China and Europe and Brazil and, every, and everything so there was very much and even I think even more commonalities than we expected but we opened up for these countries to use other concepts and also but also in in europe because like germany they said that for us a very important part of ri is sustainability so they included sustainability in the ri action plans so that was important for us not to have this kind of imperialistic uh, approach <clears throat> Um, any, anybody else wants to ask something? Hey. Fabio, yes. Yes, ju just I, I, I just I would ask uh, Alain Marie if uh, she wants to say something uh, more about uh, how the next uh, research program, uh, Horizon Europe, should um, capitalize uh, all the uh, the results, the outcomes of this. Uh, 10 years, no, more than 10 years, but, but anyway, it's a long story of experiences mm. uh, related to, um, yeah, responsible research and innovation, but more in general, going back uh, uh, to 2000 uh, science in society in general, how all this uh, richness should be used for the future, for the future of the next program. I think it's an occasion having you today mm -hmm. <laughs> to ask this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm glad you asked. Uh, we are going to have, um, together with Alexander Gerber on uh, when, on, sorry, on, uh, to, well, tomorrow, <laughs> we are going to have a, a session on that uh, where I will be presenting uh, some of my reflections on what is coming up in Horizon Europe because I'm, I'm working now on a kind of a lobby project funded by the Research Council of Norway, where we have been um, trying to get information on what's happening in Horizon Europe and also to influence it and see if we can try to strengthen the visibility of RRI uh, in Horizon Europe. And um, I think that um, it's... I'll, I will give, give some credit to the RI people in the European, European Commission. I, they are working to continue to make use of all the experiences from the last 10 years or whatever uh, of RRI, but also before RRI, into Horizon Europe. And they have succeeded um, on different levels. Uh, RRI is uh, an overall objective and it's in the whole mandate uh, of uh, the Horizon Europe pr program. It's also, um, so there is kind of this overall mandate for RRI and Horizon Europe. <clears throat> um, the whole mission orientation is of course a way you could say that is an RRI ethos in that uh, and that it doesn't com come necessarily from the RI community, but 
this is a, uh, an adaptation of research funding that is in line with a, at least quite a few of the uh, convictions of our right. Um, and then we have, I think there won't be any swaths. Uh, RRI will be placed in uh, widening and strengthening, the, the widening and strengthening program of Horizon Europe, uh, which is very much focused on, uh, on the widening countries. So I'm not sure what kind of visibility there will be there. It's placed there with open science, ethics, uh, gender, and these are the keys. And it's there, but it, it doesn't have the same visibilities. But on the other hand, for instance, the definition of ethics, research ethics, uh, and that is included in Horizon Europe is probably wider than it was in Horizon 2020. So it's more incorporating elements of RI into the research ethics concept, uh, which I quite like also coming from research ethics, where and in Norway we've always taken a very broad approach to research ethics. So I think quite a few of the, of the, of the learning points and the experiences from RI come in there. And also, of course, you have citizen science and, and the broad open science agenda. So I think the most disappointing so far from what I've learned about Horizon Europe is the European Innovation Council. I think um, it's more or less absolutely RI free. <laughs> And uh, it's very much uh, about uh, groundbreaking radical innovations, but without any more or less any sensitivity on societal issues, uncertainties, or or all of the RRI aspects that we are uh, we are promoting. So I think that yeah, all in all, um, there is a lot of lessons still that are captured in Horizon Europe from earlier RRI work. Fortunately, though with slightly less visibility of the concept, but I think that, and I would like to kind of invite all of you to <laughs> join us join in this work for increasing the sensitivity for our eye in where it really kind of is urgent with the groundbreaking new technologies and the innovation part of Horizon Europe. If I, I, I know Lyndon is here, so maybe Lyndon can comment as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I can see Giovanni raising his hand, yes, and speak. Yes. yes um, Hi, thank you very much for, for the talk. And uh, no, I wasn't just uh, to ask a little follow up um, question on, on my previous question, uh, because maybe I, I haven't formulated very well. And uh, I didn't want uh, to very much to, uh, to assume that the private sector is uh, less open to RRI than the, the public sector. I think that in some cases, uh, a public institution and research institution can be pretty conservative and uh, business is very innovative. Uh, I was uh, more concerned about uh, what we can perhaps call uh, incremental innovation or uh, innovation which is not uh, radical or, or very new, but it's more uh, the bringing of uh, uh, innovation to more products, to products uh, that are often of lower cost. So, uh, because I think that the, the emphasis has very much been on, on innovation, on research, on, on things that are very close to the cutting edge, but uh, very often the way in which uh, some innovation then hit society very strongly is when they become more popular, when they are implemented and extended to products that are low cost and, uh, and therefore are developed not by very innovative or uh, uh, big uh, companies, but often by small companies working on uh, uh, at very competitive uh, level uh, with very low profit margin. So how can we extend the, the agenda of a responsible innovation to this kind of innovators that are not the, the big innovators, but are often those that really bring innovation to the public and sometimes they cannot afford to do it in a particularly considerate way. Hmm. No, I think that's a very important question. 
and it is a dilemma that we talk about responsible research and innovation as one thing because i think that often what we do talk about when we say all right is responsible research um, and a lot of the things we talk about won't fit with for these kinds of companies, SMEs, and you know that you talk about. So it will be uh, it will make them estranged, kind of, from the whole concept. So we, I think we might want to. I, for me, at least, I think RI where it came from and what it, where it's absolutely necessary is for the very radical research-based uh, innovations and also other kinds of innovations should be responsible of course but uh, the, the norms and the way we address it uh, doesn't very it doesn't fit that well if we use these concepts that we use for responsible research so no i, I think that's a, a field for more work basically Thank you. Uh, also, may I say that this is a very interesting topic and uh, Andrea Riccio from Sapienza is here and uh, we're starting a project together called the RRI Start, which is going to focus exactly on uh, early stage uh, innovation, uh, early stage funding for innovation and startups and so on, and how to bring these uh, RRI concepts into this, which I think it's, a, it's, it's quite, uh, quite unique. Uh, because we were all focusing uh, in all our projects mostly on uh, academia and on the research part of the research and innovation. So the innovation part, and especially uh, early stage uh, startups and so on, this is an important topic and hopefully you can have some answers in the future. Mm -hmm. We still have to start this project. So uh, with this and if, uh, if there is no other question, I think we should uh, close this session. Thank uh, Dr. Fosberg uh, very much for this really very interesting uh, discussion and we're going to follow it up next uh, next day <laughs> as yeah. you said so we're all looking forward for tomorrow uh, as you know there are two parallel sessions now so please choose your parallel session and uh, i'll see you i will be in the second one in, in five minutes <laughs>